Hi, I'm Laurie Corey, and I'm here today with Glenn Bagels. Um, we're gonna start uh, with a cleansing of the sage this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Glenn. That's a great way to start. That's a great way to start. Well, we like to start off right. Yes, we for sure. Cleanse the environment here, so we, we make sure we say the right things today and, and do the right things. Yes, and for you, you know so much about seminal history, which is the topic we're going to talk about today, different aspects of uh, um, what we do historically in our group, and I know you from many years back. I know you started 2007, I believe, or much earlier yeah, well, than that. Tell me a little bit about how you got started um, with the Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationists. We're both members of that group. You were there before I was. And um, your local historian, uh, give, give me a little background on well, how the, this all the, the way I got started in this this endeavor uh, was from a man uh, because of a man named Richard Prozick. He ended up being my mentor uh, with the Seminole War history, taught me quite a bit about uh, what we were doing, mm -hmm. and also led the charge to save and preserve the Loxahatchee River battlefield site in Jupiter. Um, Richard at the time uh, was working uh, behind his house at, at a Tennessee volunteer camp. Uh, researchers had found out that uh, there was no sign of the, the 500 Tennessee volunteers that were in the Battle of Loxahatchee River at Fort Jupiter, so they began looking for them elsewhere. Well, they found them in the shores of Jupiter. Um, the developer at the time was uh, working to clear lots and, and build homes, and uh, Richard Prosick put an ad in the paper uh, recruiting uh, avocational archaeologists and helpers to, to dig the site. We had two or three days to, to get as much uh, material out of there as we could uh, before the site was bulldozed. So that's the way I got started and that was probably about 1989. Mm -hmm. And then um, as obviously things uh, were discovered uh, archaeologically in the area, surveys done, site found yes and um, other people came in to join um, how did that progress into the formation of the Loxahatchee battlefield preservationists well, yes as, as you said there were many people that deserve credit for for rediscovering the Loxahatchee River battlefield um, you know it's kind of strange because the old Jupiter old timers they, they knew where the battlefield was but they were mysteriously closed-mouthed about it uh, the people that owned the property uh, prior to Palm Beach County Parks and Recreation taking over the property uh, didn't say much about it even though they did uh, lead tours uh, in the early days probably back in the 1960s and 1970s and did mention the battle uh, but in uh, 1992 around 1992 there as I said there were many people that were responsible for discovering the battlefield researchers found the battle in, uh, Lox in on the Loxahatchee River in Jupiter uh, it was once thought to be in Jonathan Dixon State Park, but that wasn't adding up, so they began looking south in, in the Jupiter area, and they found it at River Bend and Loxahatchee River Battlefield Park, as we call them now. Right, right. And then surveys were done by archaeologists um, that uh, also marked uh, as uh, artifacts, evidence of history on right. the site. Well, the way it really got started was uh, a man named Issa Ham Bryant uh, decided that we needed to have a ceremony every year to commemorate the battle and honor the people that fought and, and died and lived on the Loxahatchee River back in 1838. Uh, Issa was friends with Steve Carr. Steve Carr 
took him to the battlefield park. Uh, Isa got out, took his shoes off, and walked the entire park. And uh, came back uh, and said he had found the site uh, for our first ceremony. So about 19, I believe it was 1996 or so, we did our first uh, Seminole Maroon uh, commemoration on the battlefield underneath what we call now call the Freedom Tree. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. Um, and then, so these, that, that was always commemorated every year, mm -hmm. as I uh, remember hearing that you would go to the river, right. do blessings. Yeah, it's an ongoing event today. But, yes. but to get, get to the actual battlefield now, um, yes, you know, there were plenty of materials that were recovered by our local historians and avocational archaeologists in the area. Um, at one time, they were, it was kind of frowned upon, but now we thank our lucky stars that they did recover this material because this material will be eventually put in a beautiful interpretive center at the battlefield that Palm Beach County is, is, is uh, uh, talking about building out there. And so we're very grateful for that. But then we had three formal surveys. Uh, two of them were conducted by state archaeologist Bob Carr, mm -hmm. and the third one from an independent group that had come in. And they fixed the battlefield at the site that we have now, the Loxahatchee River battlefield mm -hmm. uh, uh, site. And uh, basically in 2007, you know, we, we, we did events out there, we did History in the Park, we call it Richard Prosick's uh, History in the Park series, uh, something that was uh, created by Richard Prosick, our, one of our, our patriarchs. Um, we, uh, uh, they fixed the battlefield at the Loxahatchee River um, and confirmed it once and for all. And, and really the, the hard evidence that really confirmed that it was the battlefield was the discovery of the artillery. You know, yes. in Florida, people were shooting guns all over the place. You know, Florida is a, is a place where there's a lot of, a lot of uh, hunting and things like that. So it wasn't unusual to find a musket ball or a bullet somewhere. But uh, once the artillery was found, the Congreve rockets, the grape shot, um, case shot cannonballs, when some of those were found, we pretty much knew, or the archaeologists pretty much knew, that they had the, the correct site for the battlefield. And the top topography of the battlefield, the topography of the river was also another clue that uh, the researchers used to find the battlefield. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you've been president for the Loxahatchee Battlefield um, Preservationist um, for many years. I uh, worked with you. Yes. Uh, and how many um, how many years were you on the board? I believe you've been on. Well, for a you while? know, interestingly enough, I've never served served on the board of directors, but I was the president twice. I was the president from. Mm -hmm. uh, I th uh, 2011 to uh, 2000, early 2014, uh, when I stepped down, um, and then I returned to the group in 2018 after a couple years of illness. Returned to the group, and in 2000, last year 2023, I was elected president again, um, and I just recently stepped down. We have a, a great uh, man, a, a nice. I call him a young man because his energy is young. He, yes. But uh, Derek Hankerson has yes. come in to take over for me and and we just received a, a great honor from the, the federal government we made the national register of historic places and so we've we've reached a, a plateau in which we really with the museum on the way and now the the honor of being named to the historic registry um, we felt that uh, we need somebody like Derek to come in and, and take this this group to the next level which is terrific, mm -hmm. but we've been there for quite a long time, and as yeah. I recall, we've been working on this for 15 years to get on uh, the applying for this uh, historic register. Yeah, you know, and this is a really major, big deal for us to yeah. get recognized. Yeah, it's something that we wanted for a long time. I I did not realize, but the the county archaeologist Chris Davenport uh, said that it was an 18-year effort, which I, just shocked me because mm -hmm. time. Yeah. you know go so fast these days and you don't know if something happened five years ago or five weeks ago sometimes you you know your memory banks would get kind of foggy but uh, it was a it was an 18 year effort to get this name to the historic register yes so we we really have to thank palm beach county for spearheading this um, another major player in this uh in in getting our 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 uh recognition federal recognition was the Seminole Tribe of Florida. They were quite instrumental in providing the documentation and the history 
that actually pushed uh, you know our, our certification over the finish line. Exactly. So we definitely want to thank Palm Beach County and, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And of course we can't forget the Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationists. We, we did incorporate in, in 2007, but many of the members from the Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationists were there many, many years before. Um, I started going to the battlefield in, in 2000, I mean in uh, 1994. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't one of the archaeologists, I wasn't one of the researchers, I didn't find the battlefield, but occasionally I would go out with Richard and we would see what the guys were finding and that's where I met Steve Carr at that particular time. Steve became our first president of the Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationists. Yes, yes. And it does take uh, a group to make this happen and you've mentioned different groups that we are working in tandem, work together. It's uh, with cultures and the yes. Seminole Tribe of Florida and um, you have this natural ability uh, a gift to talk with the Seminoles <clears throat> and to bring them uh, closer in with us so we're talking about um, sharing history, mm -hmm. accurate history, right. not from one perspective but from a perspective of what was this like for everyone and connecting with them yeah. has been essential. Yeah, you know, most battlefield parks, the, the documentation and the the uh, text and, and the, the battlefield signs and things like that are, are written from the standpoint of the United States Army uh, or the United States Navy. Um, basically, you know, the people that camped out on the battlefield that night. But there were other people that were involved. And those were the Seminoles and Miccosukees. And, uh, the, you know, a lot of the Seminoles that were at our battle ended up on the Trail of Tears. Jupiter has two Trail of Tears routes. One runs through the park and the other one runs down Military Trail. Um, but, uh, you know, when it, and it comes, I, I wouldn't say I have a gift for talking to the Seminoles. I think it's just a respect. Yes. You know, uh, uh, we were at the uh, convocation of Seminole War historians a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, one of our Seminole friends, Pedro Zapata, mentioned the fact that you know, we don't always have to have input, but we like a seat at the table and we like to know what's going on. So, you know, it's a matter of keeping them informed. Um, the other thing is, 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 is giving them a voice. You know, we yes. like to, to look at things through the eyes of, of the indigenous people that lived at Loxahatchee, uh, at the Loxahatchee Battlefield, which was a well-established village, as, you know, we've, we've come to find out. Exactly. That had been, you know, there for thousands of years. Right, two villages. Yeah, yeah, and there were two villages during during the battle. Mm -hmm. um, generally, the villages are segregated, so we had one that was the African American or the Freedman Village. Uh, some people refer to them as Maroons, and then we had the Seminole Village as well. So there's two two villages at the park that were under attack in 1838. So getting back to the Seminoles, you know, it's basically showing them respect, giving them a voice, giving yes. them a seat at the table. Uh, and, and talking from their perspective, studying and talking to their perspective. And I remember the question was raised uh, some years ago, you know, what books can we read? Mm. You know, what, what can we do to learn the ways of, of the indigenous uh, people of Florida? And the answer came back from one of our Seminole friends, there are no books. Right. We will teach you. Yes. So it's just a matter of listening to what they say keeping your mouth shut, zip it when you don't have anything constructive to say, listen and learn and respect. So it's not so much a gift other than the fact that it's just, just respect and just common decency, yes. you know, to say that somebody else has another opinion about this. And, and a that, level of that's not, And that's not necessarily wrong. No. You know, it may mm -hmm. be different than the Army, it may be different than the Navy that fought at the first battle of, uh, the first battle of uh, Jupiter Inlet you know, mm -hmm. which was also located at Loxahatchee River. Um, it may not agree with the historical record, but it's their record and it's their history and they have a right to tell their history the way they see fit. And so we, 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 uh, we look at that and, and we try to showcase that as well as the military history. There is no disrespect for the mm -hmm. military side of this thing whatsoever. You know, we cherish our military people, you know, our, our uh, soldiers and sailors and airmen and, and things like that today. So there's no disrespect to the historical record, but that's just the way that's just the way we make sure we get the full story. Absolutely, and that is our goal when we do tours. We do tours um, uh, throughout the season on mm -hmm. you know uh, weekly, 
Saturday tours on the battlefield. Yeah. And um, that's our goal. And you're one of our, you know, docents uh, to share that story. But I want to also, like we're talking about our relationships uh, with people in our history. Uh, we, meaning white man, has written historically, we write things down and it's recorded a certain way. And I know with when we're talking to the Seminole tribe of Florida, that we're talking to, uh, we're talking and learning, uh, listening mostly of their story because it wasn't recorded like ours. So these mm -hmm. communications that we have with them are very important. Absolutely. It's, it's critically important to, to tell the full story yes. of the Seminoles and Absolutely. the Nicosukis of, of Florida. Absolutely. Yes. So here we are, um, I'm thinking back, Len, of years ago, and this all started coming about on the subject of the Trail of Tears. We had conversations uh, that began on, and people don't know this, the public doesn't realize this, Trail of Tears, everybody thinks it's you know, up north and mm -hmm. somewhere else. Yeah, North Carolina. People Cherry, do right. not realize the Trail of Tears is where we're part of that right here uh, in Jupiter. Right. And this is, uh, we were, I'm privileged to be uh, part of this discovery with you on this coming about. Can you tell me how, tell me about the this all, how it came together? Well, you know, it, it it comes through the research basically and one person in particular uh, uh, one of the researchers one of the avocational archaeologists and historians that actually went to Washington DC a, a gentleman by the name of Ken Hughes wrote a book called uh, Fort Jupiter and it's in my opinion it's, it's definitely one of the best books you know on the history of the Seminole Indian War in Florida and, and also in Jupiter um, and in that he has a list, he has a list of names, and there are 696 names on that list. And the list uh, is of warriors, uh, women, children, um, freedmen, black Seminoles, uh, all the people that came into Fort Jupiter. And when we talk about the Trail of Tears, we have to talk about this. After the Battle of Oka or after the Battle of Loxahatchee River, I should say, um, the troops were, the army was pretty much decimated, but on February 15th, or February 5th, 1838, the army was back on the road again, and they tracked the Seminoles a little bit south of here, about 20 miles south. Uh, they were all lined up to do battle, and then emissaries of peace uh, showed themselves with the white flag of truce, and they came out and they had a quick conference with the uh, army officers, General Jessup, General Eustace, and some of the others that were present that day. And they said to the, the general, look at our people. They are so destitute. They are so broken down. Our children are naked. Our women are naked. We don't have food to eat. They're following your horses, you know, trying to find little pieces of kernels of corn that are dropped on the ground so they have something to eat. We can't possibly make it, you know, to Oklahoma. And they petitioned that they would stay here. Well, General Jessup, you know, uh, with the urging of some of his officers realized that uh, yeah they are in destitute shape um, we do have them and you know this isn't a very nice thing but we do have them here in South Florida uh, if we ever find that we need to remove them we have them in one place and we can remove them but until then I'm going to petition Washington City it was called Washington City not DC at the time I'll petition Washington City to allow you all to stay on a reservation in South Florida. And with that, General Jessup declared that the war was over. He announced that we had uh, a brand new fort up in Jupiter on the Loxahatchee River, now uh, what they would call uh, in a subdivision that they call Pennock Point today, uh, was the first fort Jupiter. And he told the Seminole leaders, Tuskegee and Halakejo, he said, bring your people into the fort and we'll petition the government to allow you to stay in Florida. Now, I believe this was a sincere offer at the time, but General Jessup was a man that was guilty of something that we called the grab game. And the grab game was capturing Seminoles, inviting them in for a, a truce, 
or a talk or, or a meeting and then arresting them and seizing them and jailing them uh, you know on the spot under the white flag of truce well you know maybe the Seminoles uh, should have looked at this a little bit further or maybe they didn't even know about it we don't know but in any case I would say probably about seven maybe a little over 700 Seminoles did come into Fort Jupiter over the next month and a half to two months uh, January through February so there was a great gathering of Seminoles they stayed in their own village and as far as I know they could come and go as they pleased uh, they could go out and hunt um, they could go out and uh, do a number of things to sustain themselves and things were pretty good at the fort uh, and I say that loosely because the fort was a terrible place for anybody to be but uh, as, it set, as it turns out the Seminoles and the soldiers actually had a soldiers had quite a bit of respect for the Seminoles and uh, they got along just fine well the word came back on on March 15th 1838 that the Seminoles must go west and with that General Jessup made plans to round the Seminoles up at Loxahatchee River well on the morning of the 20th March 20th 1838 first thing in the morning Colonel Twiggs surrounded the, the Seminole village at, Lox, at the uh, Fort Jupiter and raided the fort and he captured 696 Seminoles under a white flag of truce this making it the largest capture of indigenous people under the white flag in American history that occurred right here in Jupiter Florida yeah. um, almost immediately the blacks were separated from the the Seminoles the the black residents uh, and taken out to Fort McRae on the Trail of Tears and this is where we talk about the Trail of Tears we talk about the Trail of Tears because there are two routes in Jupiter and as you said most people think the Trail of Tears was north of here but the Trail of Tears affected uh, in particular the five civilized tribes eventually it would affect many many more tribes than the five civilized tribes but the five civilized tribes were the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek and the Seminoles and those were the people that were targeted initially and the Seminoles were no different they may have been the last to, to travel on the tra Trail of Tears but after that capture at eight, in 1838 at Fort Jupiter, they were immediately sent on the Trail of Tears. Probably by 1841, uh, there might have been close to a thousand Seminoles that walked the Trail of Tears out of Jupiter uh, to the Oklahoma mm -hmm. territories. Mm -hmm. Now, we had a, a history-making event back in 2022. It was called the Convocation of Seminole War Historians. And I remember talking to one of my Seminole friends prior to I believe it was the 2018 2019 I forgot when we did that in Jupiter or in uh, Okeechobee Okeechobee had the convocation last and I said to one of my Seminole friends I said are you going to be at the convocation and he said to me he said why he said all it is is a bunch of white guys sitting around talking about us we never have a voice so I took that to heart I took that I took that to heart and mm -hmm. I listened to what he had to say and when it came time for us to do our convocation uh, in 2000, I think it was 2020, you know, COVID was, was rip-roaring and maybe our convocation, or it was supposed to be in 2021, but COVID was rip-roaring and, and of course the convocation was postponed due, due to the illnesses around the United States. Um, but in the meantime, we started thinking and one of my friends, another uh, once again talking about Pedro uh, my friend Pedro from the Seminole tribe uh, happened to mention to me when we were chatting on messenger on Facebook he said listen you know we got this guy out there in Oklahoma his name is Lewis Johnson he's the uh, assistant chief of the great Seminole nation of Oklahoma he says you really got to get this guy well no sooner I got off the computer off the uh, chat with Pedro I called uh, assistant chief uh, Johnson and he picked up the phone mm -hmm. and I told him what we were doing and I said listen would you like to come and speak at the convocation and of course he immediately accepted my invitation however there were formalities that had to be put aside before he could actually officially accept it there are councils he has to go through he has to talk to the Seminole tribe of Florida um, make sure that's okay with them this is their state this is their land um, but he answered well then it started the snowball we started thinking about um, well you know my young friend said uh, we never have a voice at these convocations let's give them a voice let's make this about them 
mm -hmm. and let's let's let them tell their story for the first time. Let this be about them and let them tell their story as they see fit. And that's what we did. Yes. We invited indigenous speakers to come to the convocation in Jupiter in 2022, April of 2022. And on the last day, the last day was very, very emotional. The last day was a symbolic walk down the Trail of Tears. Now, if you can imagine this, the Seminoles and Miccosukees of Florida had been um, separated from their Oklahoma uh, relatives for cl darn close to 200 years mm -hmm. since the war. Mm -hmm. um, there was some animosity between the, the, the three groups, and therefore they weren't very good friends at the time. And we took an uh, incredible chance by inviting the, the, the great Seminole Nation of Oklahoma into Florida. But eventually there were individuals from the tribes, the Miccosukee tribe of Florida and the Seminole tribe of Florida that thought it was a good idea and they stepped up to the plate. They got approval from their councils to attend the event. So we actually had a symbolic walk where they did a ceremony at what we call a place called Indian Crossing. That was where some of the heaviest fighting went on during the battle and also at the uh, part of the Trail of Tears. They gave a and, blessing there. And they gave a blessing, right, and they sang. For the first time, the West right. meets the, they, the, the West coming right. back Right, this to was the, the East. first time that the Oklahoma Seminoles were returning to Florida since yes. their exile to Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So they did the ceremony, they did the cleansing, and then they did a walk down the Trail of Tears back to their village of 1838. Mm -hmm. And it was very emotional, there were a lot of tears, you know, they were walking with their brothers and sisters of the Seminole and Miccosukee tribes of Florida. Meeting it their was, family, it was their ancestors, right. it was, it for was, the very first time. Right, it was this absolutely, was very emotional. right, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, not a dry eye in the place, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Um, and th this reunification of the three tribes took place. Um, I think, you know, besides making history in that regard, you know, the convocation was a complete success because we gave the indigenous community a voice and we let them t talk about anything that was on their mind. Yes, for sure. And they did and it was incredibly interesting and we were incredibly grateful for their participation. We had an incredible panel of guests that, that uh, weekend and right. they are also coming together, uh, Chief Lewis Johnson, we had people from the Seminole tribe here as well. Right, yeah. And they're connecting. Right, you know. And, for, and the com camaraderie of being with family and friendships, it was, it, it, you know, yeah. this is hundreds of years of separation. Right, well, you know, by the time the convocation did take place, Lewis Johnson had become the, the primary chief of the great Seminole nation of o Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had brought an entire contingent. He brought a couple of the individuals from the color guard, right. as well as some uh, uh, council members and and, it was and people Tiger. like that. Yes, it was it was an incredible mm -hmm. incredible experience for us uh, to hear them talk about uh, their experience on the Trail of Tears and what they th their people went through, and uh, there again what our Florida Seminoles and Miccosukees went through in, in reference to the war. And we also learned a lot about their culture. It just wasn't about yes. the Seminole Indian War. It was a, a lot about their culture and the way they educate their children and the way they live and their and their customs and yes, and, and trying the, to retain their culture. Right, which and is trying to retain the culture, which deal. is big. Which is where we try to come in to help be that platform. Right, that, that's what we want to do is help be that platform. Right, to, for them to speak, carry on their culture, be part of what happened here, uh, not a happy story, but but it is culture, it's people, and um, it's an honor. It was an honor to be able to be part of that, uh, the Seminole War Historians um, Convocation, and um, to, have, to have those cultures come together, and um, yeah, I feel very fortunate to be part of all that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was, it and was there's a, also, I was thinking also the uh, flag. Remember we had talked about yeah, yeah. bringing the flag. That was something that was started with you. Tell me a little bit about the, the, how the, the flag, well, uh, the Seminole flag, and come into being. And it does kind of segue into... Yeah, well, you know, indigenous people have a saying, about. and it's, it's just not specific to Florida. 
And the saying is, you're on stolen land. And, you know, that is true. I mean, this, this, this land, and we, we won't go into the politics of it for, for this, but uh, we won't go into this, but uh, initially that was all indigenous. You know, the entire continent, uni continental United States was indigenous territory. And therefore, I think it was terribly important to uh, allow them to come in, or to invite them, I should say, invite them to come in and talk about that. And one of the things about the Seminole tribe, and you mentioned trying to hold on to their culture, as I try to collect my thoughts here, as they try to hold on to their culture is they're a sovereign nation. They're essentially a sovereign country, as many indigenous tribes are. But, you know, as far as their culture goes, they have to, they have to maintain a certain connection to their culture in order to main, maintain their independence. independence. Yes. yes. And so, therefore, you know, the, the, the school up in Brighton, at Brighton Reservation, where the young children are started speaking uh, the Seminole language or, or the Miccosukee language, I'm not exactly sure. There's two different languages there. Exactly. I'm not sure exactly who speaks what. But speak the indigenous language, let's just say. And they start them as early as 14 months. And when you're at that facility, you are not allowed to utter a word of English. And that is just one of the small things that, you know, the indigenous tribes here in Florida are trying to maintain by maintaining their culture and maintaining their language and maintaining their customs. And of course, just like any, any group of people in the United States now, you know, we're always fighting the cell phone. You know, our primary interest is that, that device in our hands, and it's no different for them either. And so, you know, just like us, it's an uphill battle yeah. to, to, to make sure that uh, their culture is honored, their culture is continued, because there's always somebody looking to take something away, mm -hmm. and they know that. So it's why it's so important for them to maintain their culture. Sure. Historically, right. they, right. Uh, you know, Right. We've let them down over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah, you could, yes. Yeah. So, you know, that's where, you know, we're well, trying to come in to change A, a big, a big example of that is, is the uh, big grab at Fort Jupiter in 1838. That's a very good example of, you know, some of the, some of the ways we, we treated our indigenous friends. Yeah, yeah, you know. exactly. Right. Well, it's a heavy subject. Yes, for it is. Sure. It's heavy and it's also very delicate. You have to be very careful how you how you put things. Yes. Um, you know, you don't want to cross that line. You don't yeah. want to say something inappropriate. So you have to be very careful and very measured about how you talk about these things. Right, right. As we try to be. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we sometimes we step in it though. <laughs> but, you know, I'm lucky enough that if I step in it, my friends let me know. <laughs> and, you know, not always in the nicest terms, but, uh, yeah. you know, they let you know and you learn and you don't make that mistake again, or at least you try not to. Right, right. You know, exactly. it all has to do with respect. Yes. Respect. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> it's very laid back here. <sighs> so, Glenn, tell me a little more about this. It's the subject matter that's like, uh, it's, it's, it's hard, it's uh, emotional. And this is the part a lot of people do not know, the story of Fort Jupiter. And then we're talking about the Trail of Tears. What was it like, the Trail of Tears? What was it like, Fort Jupiter, when they were held in the stockade? I know there were a certain number of children, women that were mm -hmm. taken, the number of people, and taken out west. What, did it, what was it like? Well, it was deplorable conditions, and it was deplorable conditions for the indigenous people there, the African-American people there, as well as the soldiers and sailors that were stationed at, at Fort Jupiter. The conditions were very primitive uh, in nature. The terrain that we see around Jupiter now is nothing like the terrain that it would have been uh, 180, what, 188 years ago now, 186, 100, 187 years ago now. Um, one of the things that uh, I've read where an uh, army officer basically states, and when he's talking about Jupiter and, and the Battle of Loxahatchee River, and their journey to Loxahatchee and Jupiter at the time, uh, I just remember the quote, and the quote was, water, water everywhere. So if you can imagine that 
literally everything, every piece of ground you stepped on was covered with water. It was no different for the soldiers. Right. Uh, we, used to, the we, we, we know roadways, right, right, in our world. But right. back then, their roadway was the canals and rivers right. and streams. Right. It was very difficult here. for the soldiers. Now, the Seminoles, on the other hand, you know, they used the waterways right. as their highway, their transportation. Mm -hmm. um, the military eventually picks up on that starting in about, I would say, 1836. You see your first expeditions down to New River by the Navy, uh, just scouting expeditions. But by 1838, 1839, 1840, um, the United States Navy or the Revenue Cutter Service, which is today's United States Coast Guard, were transporting soldiers via the river. Now, the Seminoles were very good about this. Mm -hmm. But at the time of the battle and the time of our existence at Fort Jupiter, um, this was all new to the average soldier. The average soldier, soldier came from a city. They had never experienced anything like Florida before. And there is a uh, quote, I don't remember who exactly says it, which army officer exactly says it, it may have been Surgeon Mott. Um, but uh, he, he talks about the fact that um, the conditions are so deplorable and that the soldiers are so destitute. And he states that at the time of the battle, when the troops arrived at the Battle of Loxahatchee, uh, almost one third of the troops were barefoot. Now, if you can imagine walking around in Florida, you know, in 1838, it's, it's kind, of, kind of iffy walking around barefoot in the woods now, let alone in 1838. Uh, the uniforms are rotted from their backs. Um, they had uh, uh, diseases like yellow fever, malaria, and something that they called brain fever, which and was dysentery. probably yeah dysentery, which was probably the brain fever was probably something akin, something like a, a migraine headache, but uh, possibly as a result of sunstroke or, or extreme heat exhaustion, uh, where these soldiers would have headaches for days and days on end. Um, Particularly at Fort Jupiter, uh, when the soldiers arrived at Fort Jupiter, it was no paradise. You know, we look at the Loxahatchee River now and look at the real estate and the big houses on the Loxahatchee, but it wasn't like that. Nobody wanted to be there. Um, the alligators, the rattlesnakes, the water moccasins, every kind of bug you can imagine. Um, one of the officers basically states, to find a dry place to lay your blanket was to lay down with every lo loathsome creature known to man. Mm -hmm. And so he's talking about if you can find a dry place to uh, lay your blanket, there's probably going to be snakes up there getting out of the water. There's probably maybe an alligator. There mm -hmm. Obviously, going to be scorpions and spiders and bugs and all kinds of things that that uh, are not agreeable to mm -hmm. human beings. Mm -hmm. And that became a big, big problem. Uh, also, lack of uh, clothing, lack of supplies. There was no food. Um, when the Seminoles came into Fort Jupiter after they agreed to return to the fort after Camp Truce, um, there was no food there, not for Seminoles, not for soldiers, not for anybody. And that's where the Seminoles really came, stepped up to the plate, because their warriors were able to go out and hunt, and they would bring back fish and turtles and alligators and, you know, game venison and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they would trade you know, with the soldiers. They would trade their goods and what they were bringing into the fort with the soldiers. So they got a little sustenance from them. But it wasn't until about, uh, I don't know, a week after the battle when the Navy shows up uh, with boatloads of supplies for the soldiers. So the conditions were terrible. Eventually the soldiers got new shoes, new uniforms. Um, mm -hmm. Their livestock had suffered terribly also uh, during the battle and on the, on the way down from uh, uh, northern Florida, or mm -hmm. central Florida, I should say, mm -hmm. into southern Florida. Um, you know, the, the, the wagon train that uh, accompanied uh, General Jessup's soldiers consisted of 70 wagons and ambulances and artillery. Um, so it was quite a long train, and those all had to be pulled by oxen, horses, mules. And one of the officers actually, you know, refers to that journey as the greatest destruction of horse flesh ever known mm. to man. Uh, he's talking about the fact that uh, whether you're coming out of Fort Pierce or coming out of Sanford, you're pretty much in the water the entire way. And when the soldiers pull out of Indian Town and start heading for the Loxahatchee River, I think it uh, took them three days, four days to get here from Indian Town. Walking mm -hmm. at that particular point, it was continuous bridge building and uh, you know, fording streams and creeks and canals and things of that nature. Uh, very, very difficult on the troops. 
Uh, but when the soldiers get here, you know, they're in no, no shape to fight. They're mm -hmm. actually in worse shape than the Seminoles. Now, one of the things that the soldiers, or the, they talk about at Fort Jupiter, is the condition of the Seminoles. Now, they say that the warriors were very well fed and very well clothed, but the rest of the community, uh, the black residents, the children, and the, and the women were all but naked or were in rags. Um, and they were given last, you know, choice for anything, all the supplies that came in. But the warriors were taken care of uh, fairly well at Fort Jupiter. Um, but uh, even with that, even after the supplies arrived, it was a terrible, terrible place to be. And I believe Ken Hughes states when the Army pulled out of Fort Jupiter, I think it was in late April or early May, that they left 14 bodies, soldiers, buried beneath the hot Florida sun at Fort Jupiter. So somewhere out there at Fort Jupiter are the soldiers uh, mm -hmm. that were stationed mm -hmm. at Fort Jupiter, or somewhere out there at Pennock Point, I yeah, should say. Yeah, here they are at the very end right. of their <laughs> service. Right. And, and then, you know, that yeah. also, you know, leads us into the soldiers in the cellars at the Loxahatchee River Battlefield. Um, one of our historians, uh, a man by the Graham Halls, says that uh, he, uh, that the Army came and they, they moved the soldiers to St. Augustine. But we've seen no documentation of that. And so as far as we know, the soldiers and the sailors are still buried on the Loxahatchee battlefield. So there are casualties, the United mm -hmm. States Army and Navy casualties uh, and people that perish from illness uh, buried on Pennock Point and at the Loxahatchee River Battlefield Park. Mm -hmm. um, people always ask us, uh, where are they? And of course, we don't know, we really don't know. Uh, they were probably, if they are still there, were, were buried on the high ground. Right. Um, but I think one of the things that uh, changed the county's mind in 2010 to allow us to have our own entity as Loxahatchee River Battlefield Park and change the footprint of what they were attempting to do or what they had planned to do in creating a regional uh, athletic facility for the community, um, that's when they decided, well, maybe, you know, with the burials of the soldiers and the sailors and the fact that the indigenous people from you know, almost 5,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago are still there at the Loxahatchee. Their mounds are still there to prove it. Uh, ancient Indians uh, from uh, later time periods are also, uh, their mounds are there, as well as Seminole and Miccosukee mounds. Mm -hmm. So given mm -hmm. the, mul the sheer multitude of burials between the military burials and indigenous burials, and then there may be even a few pioneer burials and do I dare say it? Maybe a couple burials from the old, good old Al Capone days. Um, and that's a whole different story altogether. <laughs> but uh, maybe a couple burials from the Al Capone days. So really when you walk on to Pennock Point where Fort Jupiter was, or you uh, go on to the battlefield, you come into River Bend Park or Loxahatchee Battlefield Park, which, uh, you know, is, they're basically one in the same park. Um, uh, when you walk onto those, you're actually in an indigenous, a sacred indigenous burial ground and also a military cemetery. So we're talking about you bringing up this um, Seminole Mound, I mean we're talking about indigenous mounds right. uh, that date back three, four, five thousand years ago. Right. So that's like a whole nother level of history in that in itself and ancient trails that animals walked on and people. Oh yeah. So. Um, that's like a whole nother level of, of indigenous history. Sure. Well, you know, as, as I already mentioned, the county has plans to build an interpretive center at the park. Uh, it remains to be seen, you know, what the design will eventually be. Uh, we're hoping to have that completed by 2026, with, keep our fingers crossed. Um, but the county is planning to do this museum. Now, one of the things that we often bring up is the battle is, is basically two hours of history out there at the Loxahatchee Battlefield Park and River Bend Park. But there is 5,000 years or more of indigenous history documented at that park. Mm -hmm. So the battle is only a very small story of the entire history of Loxahatchee Battlefield Park. And there is so much to it. Um, there's the prehistoric animals. There's the, uh, uh, you know, that used to, uh, inhabit the the, the uh, area. They talk about snails. I had we had a speaker in that one time was telling us there were snails out there as big as Volkswagen bugs, you know. Um, <laughs> so, and then of course you know then we have the ancient tribes that were there, uh, and then eventually the 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 Seminoles and Miccosukee tribes. 
Now, you know, one of the things that we, we see in, on some of the earliest maps, even before um, Lake Okeechobee in its entirety is placed on the map, um, is a trail running right out of Tampa to Jupiter. And we feel that that was an a indigenous highway, yes. not only in ancient times, but in more modern times. And so we know that the tribes were coming to Jupiter for many, many years based on the archaeological evidence and based on the old maps. Uh, we have an 1837 uh, Seat of War map that shows that trail coming right out of uh, Tampa. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the two trails that, uh, the two trail of tears that we spoke of earlier, uh, one goes down military trail to Key Biscayne where Seminoles were placed upon a steamer and taken to Baton Rouge and then uh, forced to war uh, march uh, the rest of the way to the Oklahoma territories. Um, we have the other trail of tears that goes out through the battlefield and, and basically uh, touches, almost touches the tip of the old Moroso or Palm Beach International Raceway and then makes a kind of a jog out towards uh, Indian Town and on to uh, Tampa Bay and that was the second trail of tears. Um, that would have been by, by far the more deadly trail of tears because they walked the entire way and once, it, once they were arrived at Tampa Bay, at Fort Brooke in Tampa Bay, they were taken to a concentration camp and uh, that concentration camp, uh, oh gosh the name escapes me all of a sudden, it just flew out of my head, I hate when that happens. Oh, um, 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 Egret? Um, uh, it's awful. Edgemont Key. Edgemont, Edgemont Key. Key. Yeah, yes. yeah we'll figure. Yeah, mm -hmm. took a couple seconds to get that out. But Edgemont Key, they were concentrated there, and and uh, then eventually rounded up. They were up. left there. They were actually left there. Yeah, I mean, given very little support, if any. I mean, it, you, when you talk about a concentration camp, you know, we kind of think of the Jewish experience during World War II. A concentration camp is a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. It's where they want to keep people to keep them from scattering or or getting away or moving to other parts of the state where they can get to them, where they can do what they will with them anytime they want. Correct. And so that Edgemont was a key. This is really big. Th and this was an uh, island, small island, surrounded by ocean water, right off of Tampa, right? Yeah, yeah, that it was. was uh, close to. It's actually, I believe, at that, if, I, if I, my memory serves me, it's uh, more, it's closer down to the St. Pete area, okay. you know, where the Skyway Bridge is. I believe it's in, the, in that area. I've never been to Edgemont Key. I would like to go there someday. Mm -hmm. Might be a good field trip for the LBP. I know the Seminole and Miccosukees uh, take field trips there on a regular basis to, to honor and mm -hmm. remember their, their ancestors that were, were right, kept right. there. Um, and then, you know, I mean, a lot of them were, were taken on the Trail of Tears, but a lot of them escaped as well. You know, a lot of the, uh, the black residents, uh, a lot of the African Americans, freedmen, maroons, uh, black Seminoles ended up in the Bahamas at Red Bay. Uh, now there is a Seminole population, a black Seminole population that's literally scattered throughout the entire Bahamas mm -hmm. um, that reside out there that are uh, people that fled Florida. Mm -hmm. And there mm -hmm. again, when we talk about Pennock Point, uh, Pennock Point is where the Navy land landed on the uh, on the first battle, the Battle of Jupiter Inlet. That's where the Navy put in, and the battle was a five-mile running battle back to Pennock Point. Mm -hmm. But when we talk to talk about Pennock Point, you know, we look at these old maps, and we I don't know if we have proof of this or if, if we just assume this. But it looks like to me that Pennock Point was probably a debarkation point for those African Americans seeking refuge in Cuba or in the mm. Bahamas after the Spanish left in 1821. So there's a very good chance that uh, Pennock Point was also used as that for escaped slaves escaping the plantations, right. uh, the southern plantations in the United States, formerly the European plantations, but now the southern plantations. Mm -hmm. Wow, very interesting. We're gonna say, I'm back with Glenn Bagels, our local historian here in Jupiter, Florida. I was uh, very interested in our topic as we're going along of the Seminoles and post-battle of what happened to the Seminoles. Could you tell me more about yeah, well, you know, we've already how talked they dispersed? To, yeah, we've talked about Camp Truce a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but there was another, there was another uh, chapter to that as well. You know, after the battle, 
or probably as the battle was raging, I should say, um, it's thought that the Seminoles probably used the Loxahatchee River to make their escape. It probably would have been much easier to traverse, uh, move down the rivers than it, it would be to move across land with the army in pursuit. Um, but we know they scattered in different directions after the battle. But one group went north up the Loxahatchee River, we believe. And then they turned west. And they turned west to a place that we used to call Pall Mall, um, out by the Corbett area off the Beeline Highway here in Palm Beach and Martin County, Florida. And uh, now we refer to that area as the Hungry Land. Well, back in about, let me think, I think the first ceremony we did on the north side of Indian Town Road before we were allowed on the battlefield property itself. Um, I think it was 92. The Seminoles from Oklahoma came, members of the Great Seminole Nation of Oklahoma came to that very first ceremony to commemorate the battle and honor their ancestors. And uh, during that time we, they were told, we were told a story and we were told the story of the Hungry Land Woman. And as I said this was brought to us by the Seminoles out in Oklahoma. Um, the Hungry Land Woman is a legend that has been passed down for generations. And um, what happened was, is that when the Seminoles fled the Loxahatchee River battlefield, they took refuge on an island in what we now call the Hungry Land, out by the Corbett area. And the soldiers eventually tracked the, the Seminoles to the Hungry Land. And the story has it that an officer paddled out to the island uh, with a couple of his men under a white flag of truce. And they said to the Seminoles there, we have your island surrounded. Surrender or you'll die here. Mm. And whoever the Seminole leader was there, we don't know who was in charge of that group at that particular time, but whoever the Seminole leaders were on that little island out there in the Hungry Land, said uh, to the officer, they said, we will never leave this island. We will die here before we surrender to mm. you. And with that, the young officer said to the Seminoles, then you will know this land to become the Hungry Land, and you will perish here. Well, long story short, maybe a week, maybe a two, goes by. And one night, the soldiers notice that the campfires on the island are no longer lit, that the island is dark. So their curiosity abounds, of course. And the next morning, at the break of dawn, they send a small contingent out to the island, again under a white flag of truce, to find out what's going on with the Seminoles out the island. Why weren't their campfires lit the night before? Well, when they got there, they discovered that all the Seminoles that had been hiding on that island, taking refuge from the soldiers, had escaped over time. They had filtered off in small groups over the last couple weeks. And the only person they found on the island was an ancient black Seminole woman. An ancient, old, old black Seminole woman that was too weak to flee. And this woman apparently volunteered to stay behind and keep the, the campfires stoked every single night, giving the impression that the, the Seminoles were still there. And why this was being done, small groups were sneaking off the island. Mm. and heading south towards New River to seek refuge with the Seminole survivors in the Miccosukees holed up there. That is what became the story of the Hungry Land Woman and that is the origin of the area that we call the Hungry Land now that is here in South Florida. <sighs> and it's, a, it's an incredibly heroic story. Yeah. Um, like I said, it was brought to us pro by the people out in Oklahoma. Um, it, but it, it just shows you the, the commitment and the dedication that these people had to each other, that they would sacrifice their yes. own life, knowing that they would, this woman knowing that she would probably hinder the group in, in their escape, yeah. sacrificed her How life honorable. in order to let everybody everybody get off the island. Yeah. Um, and we believe that many of those, those people that escaped that island became what we call the Seminole and Miccosukee tribes of Florida today. Mm -hmm. as we in, in rif rightfully refer to as the unconquered. Exactly. They refused to surrender, they refused to give up. For whatever reasons, they stood fast. And to this day, the Seminoles have never signed a peace treaty with the United States government. But I had a friend that told me uh, a few years ago, and he said, Glenn, you know, we're, we're still at war. 
We're still technically at war with you, but now we use the lawyer and the pen. And we're taking back our property, one piece of property at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is the legend of the Hungry Land Woman and may also contribute to the legend of the Seminole and Miccosukee tribes being called the Unconquered. Now, whether some of these people ended up on the Trail of Tears, we will never know. Mm -mm. Those kind of records were just not kept. Mm -mm. But at least for the time being, this heroic act by this old ancient black Seminole woman um, allowed you know, the rest of the group to escape to what we would say relative safety, air quotes relative safety it's, they were they were never safe it's fascinating i get chills when you tell me that story because i live here i pass the hungry lands as i'm driving along pratt whitney road and i known it to been there my you know throughout my life and this gives it a whole nother meaning and mm -hmm. names mean everything yeah and um it's uh you know very much of what we're doing here is remembering what happened then Right. You know, these are stories people don't know. I really, uh, I really enjoy you sharing these stories so we can know what really happened. What was it like then? This mm -hmm. is a story that nobody, I don't see in a textbook anywhere. No, it, it's, a, it's an unknown story. Just mm -hmm. as the history of the Loxahatchee battle is unknown. Uh, 20 years ago, 30, well, I would say 20 years ago, well, the battlefield was found about 30 years ago, or I should say rediscovered. <laughs> um, but 20 years ago, most of the Seminole War community had no knowledge whatsoever of the Battle of Loxahatchee. For some mm -hmm. reason, it was a battle that was kind of swept under the rug. Um, we have our suspicions that we know why. Uh, probably had something to do with the grab game, the, the terrible betrayal of the United States Army and the United States government against the, the Seminoles camped at Fort Jupiter under the white flag. Um, but whatever the case may be, um, you know, it, it, it's a terrible story, and uh, you know, it's it's not one that we're really proud of, but it is our history. It is. And so, it you is. know, with that, I think we should probably talk about the Seminoles after they come into Fort Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Before we carry mm -hmm. to that, just briefly, could you tell me the naming of, about the naming of the? It's the was at that time the Lokahatchee, and how that came about. The naming of that. Well, the lo Lokahatchee, or and I've I've heard it uh, said many different ways. Loxahatchee, I guess that's the white pronunciation. Lokahatchee uh, is is, uh, is an indigenous pronunciation, and I have been told by the Seminoles in Oklahoma, I believe that they they referred to the Loxahatchee as, and if I, I'm very bad in my Creek pronunciations. Um, but uh, I think they referred to it as the uh, Losa Hesse, Losa oh. Hesse, or something of that nature. So there are several different pronunciations. And I guess so it, there's Loxahatchee. It, really it originated with the Lokahatchee. Yeah. That was an Indian name meaning the mm -hmm. River of Turtles. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I asked one of my Seminole friends one day what they thought the right, right pronunciation was for Loxahatchee. And I got a variation of names, you know, around that, uh, those particular names that I just mentioned. And they said, but it's, it's really regional, he said, because the people in Immokalee might say it one way, the people on the Big Cypress may say it another way, and the people at Hollywood may say it another way. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. up at Fort Pierce and, and Brighton, they may have a whole different pronunciation for it or a, mm -hmm. a, very, a variation of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's really one correct way to oh, say no, it, depending for on, sure, but you know, who you're... Yes. you're speaking to or True. which group is speaking. True. Um, so yeah, yeah but uh, that's one thing I do not get into is I do not try to, to pronounce my Creek no, and, and we don't need to, words. But it wasn't Loxahatchee, yeah, we know that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so yeah. I, I always hesitate when I, when I try to come up with these indigenous yes. pronunciations because I, I'm probably butchering them. Oh, like, no, no, no. Yeah. So carry on with where you Yeah, well, you know, uh, after the big capture on, on uh, March 20th, what they called the Big Grab uh, by General Jessup, uh, the Seminoles were removed from their village outside the fort, and they were transported or they were marched inside the fort to the point, at Pennock Point. To the very end, to the very easternmost end, uh, the Army had built a stockade there. They had built a blockhouse, um, and then they, I guess, uh, they had built some sort of enclosure. We don't know that for sure. There are no drawings of, or schematics of Fort, Fort Jupiter. 
but they, they can find the Seminoles at the very east end of Pennock Point out there, uh, I believe, where uh, some of our researchers say Audrey Lieb used to live. But now we're a lot of those big mansions that you see out on Pennock Point and in that particular area. So they concentrated them in that particular area. And uh, they talk about the Seminoles after the capture uh, being moved to the west. Now we talked about this, the Trail of Tears, but let's talk about a little bit before the capture. Because mm -hmm. life was interesting at the fort. Uh, for Seminoles and soldiers alike. You remember I, I mentioned in one segment that the soldiers had a great deal of respect for their Seminole foes. Um, they respected their culture, they respected their bravery, their intestinal fortitude, um, so they had a great deal of respect. So life at the fort before the capture, before the big grab, as supplies started coming in, got a little bit better. You're still in Florida, you're still in the heat, you're still in the bugs and the snakes and the alligators, but life is a little bit better at this particular point. And in Ken Hughes's book, Fort Jupiter, he talks about uh, some of the things the Seminoles engaged in. They engaged in hunting parties where they went out and, and brought in game and fish and turtles uh, for the soldiers to trade with the soldiers. They engaged in sil silversmithing. They were apparently incredible artists with silver. Uh, so they would create these objects, uh, these objects of adornment and things, and they would sell those to the soldiers or trade to the soldiers. Uh, they even talk about stickball games, stickball games between the Seminole mm -hmm. groups, and that the soldiers would attend these stickball games, and they would bet on the stickball games. And, of course, horses were a big part of our battle and a big part of uh, Fort Jupiter. Um, at the Battle of Loxahatchee, there were 1,100 horse-mounted soldiers at that battle that came in on horseback. Um, so horses, most of the soldiers at Fort Jupiter were dragoons or were, were volunteer soldiers on horseback. Also, there were uh, Delaware and Shawnee Indians part of the garrison at Fort Jupiter that were fighting against the Seminoles. But uh, the Seminoles and the soldiers would take their horses and the Seminoles would take their ponies and they would make bets who's faster, the Seminole ponies or the soldiers, you know, big war horses. Mm. And they would have races, they would have competitions, and once again, they would wager, and they would trade, and they would, you know, they would, t you know, play games of chance and things like that. So it sounds like this ideal, ideal Who situation would, out yeah, there. right? So when the word came back on March 15th that the Seminoles must go west, not only was it kept a secret from the Seminoles, but it was kept a secret from the soldiers because the officers, the General, General Jessup and all his officers were afraid that the, Sem the soldiers had become so friendly with the Seminoles that they would tip the Seminoles off and they would flee before they could be captured. And that, that's part of it. So Didn't life General Jessup actually sent a letter to the Secretary of War Poinsett? Yes, jo Joel Poinsett, yes. And he... Uh, I was surprised, but his almost pleading for letting these peaceable people let them just go. Yeah. It was a part of that. Absolutely. General Jessup was very sincere when he made that offer um, for them to stay on a reservation in South Florida somewhere. Uh, however, you know, in the negotiations with his officers, when they, you know, talked about should we let these guys do this or not. Um, you know, they did keep in mind that, hey, listen, we have them rounded up. We have them contained to an area. If we ever do have to move them, we can move them. So, um, you know, that was always the thought all along. So even though maybe this reservation in South Florida may have been something that was honestly being discussed and, and, and honored, uh, if it were, were approved, um, the idea was we can still round them up if we decide we have to. Mm -hmm. And of course, eventually, just like any other treaty the Seminoles or Miccosukees or any other indigenous tribe had uh, with the uh, federal government, um, they were most always certainly broken or gone back on in some way. Uh, in other words, you know, when the need arise, when, you know, you, you think about the Black Hills expedition in Custer, General Armstrong, or Colonel Armstrong Custer, and you think about the Black Hills expedition, well that was sacred land to the, to, the, to the Sioux and to the Comanche and to the Native Americans that lived there. Uh, when they discovered gold, then of course 
white prospectors poured in. Mm -hmm. And of course, immediately, because of the gold, that truce was, was broken. So it would have been the same thing here. As the real estate became more valuable and settlers moved into South Florida, eventually the Seminoles probably would have been rounded up and moved to Oklahoma. So yeah, it was sincere at first, but I think the uh, overall uh, mm -hmm. object was is if we decide this is something we, a part of the state we want to uh, inhabit, mm -hmm. then we can move. We can move the Seminoles and the Miccosukees. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the group that actually came back into Fort Jupiter believing that the war was over. Mm -hmm. Listen, they were telling the soldiers and the Seminoles alike that the war was over. And there was no reason not to believe it at that particular point. That's one of the reasons that there, that probably the mood was so, I would say, good at Fort Jupiter is because everybody thought this thing was over. But actually, as a result of the big grab on uh, March 20th, 1838, that actually was probably the single one act that caused the Seminole Indian War to continue for another 20 years. Now, you know, we talk about the army, the, the government, they always write the records, they always write the narrative, and they have the Seminole Indian War broken into three different uh, time periods. However, I think students of the Seminole Indian War and historians nowadays are looking at the Seminole Indian War as one big continuous war, mm -hmm. 41 years long. Right. So 1817 to 1858 is what we call the Seminole Indian War now. Uh, the war is the longest war in American history. And of course, the old saying is the bloodiest and most expensive Indian war in American history as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, where, what we do where we are in Jupiter, the Battle of the Loxahatchee, is a very unique place. Um, not only one, but two battles were fought there in the Second Seminole War. Where I don't think you could find that anywhere else. Um, tell me about the battles and okay, we'll how talk a little about. bit about the battles. Um, okay, like you said, there were two battles at Loxahatchee River. The first battle being the Battle of Jupiter Inlet. Now, so a lot of people are going like, how do they get Jupiter Inlet out of you know River Bend Park and the Battlefield Park? And at the time on the maps, the only thing denoting Ju Jupiter was the Jupiter Inlet, basically. So they gave the name of the first battle, the Battle of Jupiter Inlet. Now, the unusual thing about the first battle, uh, that was primarily a naval reconnaissance expedition. And what is, what is incredible about this, this is the first time in American history you see the military using the unified command system. And this is the very first time in American history that you see true riverine warfare being engaged in on the Loxahatchee River. So there are two firsts at this battle. The first being the unified uh, command system where Army and Navy troops and sailors worked together to accomplish a specific goal. And that was done here at Loxahatchee where the Navy came in with 25 Army artillery men. Uh, some of the Navy uh, were taught to shoot muskets. They uh, landed at Pennock Point at the future location of Fort Jupiter. And they captured a Seminole woman that was uh, tending to a large herd of horses and cattle out there on Pennock Point. Mm -hmm. And they interrogated this woman and they coerced her into leading them out to the, to the Seminole village at Loxahatchee River. And she said, it's really not hard to find. All you got to do is follow this well-beaten trail and look at the campfires. You can see them from here. And so they took her as a prisoner and they began their journey five miles out to uh, what we call now Loxahatchee Battlefield Park. And when they arrived there, they were met with a, a, a war hoop uh, and a volley of gunfire. And the Seminoles were announcing basically, we're here and we're standing and we're going to fight you here. Well, Seminoles like usual, the Seminoles always prepared the battlefields meticulously. And in this case, and in the, the case of Lo Battle of Loxahatchee River, the second battle was no different. They prepared the battlefields. In this case, the Seminoles went out about uh, six to seven hundred yards and met the soldiers and the sailors and began falling back, giving the impression that they were retreating. And of course, the young officers, the Navy officers, the first officer under Lieutenant Levin Powell, and two Navy midshipmen fresh out of the academy, that's how short they were on officers here in Florida at the time, 
two Navy midshipmen that were in the Navy Academy at that time were tasked with becoming officers, and those were midshipmen MacArthur and Harrison. Uh, also, there was an Army lieutenant, a Lieutenant Fowler, that was also here at the battle. Well, they begin falling back, and of course, they give the illusion that they're, they're in retreat. And so the sailors and the soldiers give pursuit. Um, the pursuit finally comes to an end when the Seminoles decide, okay, this is far enough. They get uh, back to a, a muddy ditch or a slough. Some call it a creek, some call it a river. And that's when they close the back door and they begin to surround the soldiers and the sailors. Now with every officer wounded and shot down, um, the sailors begin a five mile retreat back to the boats. Now there's a future Civil War general at this particular battle. He's acting as a civilian uh, topographer as well as the company agent for the expedition and that is Je uh, future Confederate General Joseph E. Johnson. Mm. Uh, he's a technically a civilian at this time uh, waiting for his assignment to the topographical corps of the United States Army which was one of the elite uh, institutions of the United States Army at the time, map making, lighthouse designing, that sort of thing, engineering. Mm -hmm. And so basically he goes as uh, we assume as something to do, you know, something mm -hmm. to keep him busy uh, rather than the boredom at Fort Pierce. And he r organizes those 25 Army artillery men carrying muskets into a rear guard action. Now the sailors, not being very well trained in advance of this battle, for the most part threw their muskets to the ground and ran for the boats. And a lot of the casualties were, were shot in the back as they fled. But they in this case... They were unsuspecting this right, whole thing right, anyway. Right. So they were caught off guard. And you know, with all the officers down and Joseph Johnson now taking command of those Army artillerymen, they literally were able to cover the retreat of the sailors. Now. You know, there were quite a few casualties at this battle. There were five killed, including the, uh, the surgeon for the expedition, uh, Surgeon Leitner. And um, there were also 23 soldiers and sailors wounded. So when you talk about the, about the 65, there were 23 sailors that were left to guard the boats back at Pennock Point, uh, and the rest came into Fort Jupiter. So there's 60 some odd sailors and soldiers that come into the Loxachee battlefield and actually do battle with the Seminoles. Um, so 23 wounded, 5 dead. Okay, that's 28. That is almost 50% casualties. So they had the Seminoles nipping at their heels for 5 miles as Joseph Johnson covered their retreat and they carried their wounded back to the boats. Now their wounded was loaded, were loaded up on the boats. Mm -hmm. um, and the boats were cast off. Now, General, or uh, I, I call him General Johnson because that's the way I think of him, but <laughs> Joseph Johnson for this battle, mm -hmm. almost didn't make it to the Civil War. He was, came very close to being killed at this battle. As it turned out, uh, some people say he had seven bullet holes through their clothing. Other people say he had mm -hmm. 11 bullet holes through mm -hmm. his clothing. Other people say even more. Well, we don't know, but boy, he had a he lot of bullets just bullets. miss him. <laughs> And he took a bullet so close through his hat, so close to his scalp, and he's, you know, hairline and challenged like I am, uh, so close to his scalp that it actually creased or burned his scalp, but actually did not cut him or penetrate him in any way. So he actually left a burn mark right down mm -hmm. the middle of his head. Well, the expedition, these these uh, 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 boats that they had were flat bottom boats, and they were also able to be rigged for sailing. So they departed uh, Pennock Point, out to Jupiter Inlet, and hightailed it back to Fort Pierce. So by morning, the expedition was arriving in Fort Pierce. General Jessup had arrived at Fort Pierce on the 23rd of January with his dragoons. Mm -hmm. The Tennessee volunteers joined from uh, General Hernandez's command, joined him there. And with this excitement, with the soldiers and sailors returning to Fort Jupiter shot to pieces, immediately the big army was put into motion. Mm -hmm. And the Dragoons and the Tennessee Volunteers set off for a place that we call Camp Lloyd or Fort Lloyd, uh, just a little bit north and east of Lake Okeechobee. Okay. And that was the rendezvous point with General Eustace's uh, wagon train and artillery train. When they rendezvoused there at, at Camp Eustace, or at Camp, uh, uh, what did I say it was? <laughs> 
well, you said Camp Lloyd. Camp Can Lloyd. Okay. When they, yeah, I'm sorry. They when they rendezvoused at Camp Lloyd, after a couple of days rest, they set out for the Loxahatchee battlefield, and that entire force encompassing 1,500 soldiers and Delaware Indians, soldiers, volunteer soldiers, and Delaware Indians. So all total. Um, let me kind of re-add that up. It, all total, there were 1,635 uh, combatants against the Seminoles that day, against a Seminole force of about 200 to two, 300 people. Now, we, uh, I, what I didn't tell you is we're moving into the second battle now, the Battle right. of Loxahatchee River. Which is nine days later. Right, yeah, nine so I've transitioned after. from Fort Jupiter, or from Fort Pierce, yes. over to Camp Lloyd. And now we're moving towards the, the Loxahatchee River mm -hmm. um, because the Seminole forces have been discovered there and General Jessup is determined to bring the war to an end once and for all, one way or the other. So he sets off with the expectation this is going to be the last battle of the Seminole Indian War. It wasn't the last battle, but it was the biggest battle of the Seminole Indian War with 1,635 soldiers and Delaware Indians being engaged by 200 to 300 Seminole warriors. Now that battle was fought on, the first battle being fought on January 15th, 1838, the Battle of Jupiter Inlet. This battle was nine days later, January 24th, 1838. And this entire large army comes into the Loxahatchee. Now, it's, the battle starts about 12 noon with the advance guard of Captain Fulton arriving at the, at the battlefield. They're greeted by shots and, and whoops from the Seminole Indians that are out announcing to the advance guard, here we are come and get us, we intend to stand and fight you here. And like I mentioned about the battle, the first battle, the Seminoles had once again meticulously prepared this battlefield, much like they did at Okeechobee. Uh, they meticulously prepared this battlefield defensive-wise. Now with the Seminoles greeting the advance guard, the, first, the advance guard races to their horses, a young dragoon, a young 15-year-old dragoon. Uh, John Roberts says this, he says, we entered a high hammock about 30 yards. A whoop was raised. We dismounted and charged. We charged again. We realized we were being surrounded. We flew to our horses to warn the army four miles behind. And what he's talking about is the advance guard is going to tell General Jessup that you have just discovered the Seminoles. So when the soldiers and, and, uh, uh, and the volunteer soldiers start coming in, the first troops to arrive are 600 mounted 2nd Dragoon regular army troops. Now immediately they're pulled into the hammock, they're dismounted, uh, they're one horse handler to every seven horses they say, uh, they dismount and they begin to assault the river. Now part of the Dragoons end up in a deep cypress swamp mm -hmm. and they're traversing through water. So what happens there? In cypress knees. In cypress knees. So what's happening there is their horses are breaking their ankles and their legs on yes. the cypress knees. They're stumbling, they're sinking into the mud up to their saddle girths. The soldiers' ammunition and flints are now wet. They don't have any ability to fire back at the Seminoles and the Seminoles keep them uh, uh, pretty much holed up in that cypress swamp and in that hammock for the next two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually the Dragoons would reach the river, swim the river, find themselves on the Seminole flank and that would bring the battle to an end. But in the meantime, the second group of, of troops that arrived were the Tennessee Volunteers, 500 mounted uh, Lauderdale, they were called Lauderdale's Regiment of Spies. Yes. And these were Tennessee Volunteer troops under the command of Major William Lauderdale. Now, we've never found any record whatsoever that Major William Lauderdale was at the battle. It's still a big question mark mm -hmm. in our mind. Where was Major Lauderdale? Was he still at, uh, San, up in Sanford at Fort Mellon? Uh, some people say he probably had brain fever or he was ill at the time. He was elderly at the time. He was in his 60s. Mm -hmm. You can imagine riding around down here in your 60s fighting the Seminole Indians. Wasn't he at Fort Pierce? Possibly or no? No, no. Okay. He was, as right. far as I, oh yeah, well he was, if he came into Fort Pierce, he, probably would have been at the battle, but the fact that he was not at the battle or the fact that we believe he was not at the battle uh, okay. was probably he was up at, up at uh, Fort Mellon in Sanford, Florida. Okay. Um, so these troops come in, the Tennessee volunteers get pulled straight ahead. They were thinking they're on the left flank, but they get pulled right into the teeth of the Seminole fire. The Seminoles have now notched the trees to rest their, their rifles to take aim. They're in the trees uh, stationed above the soldiers as they're coming through. 
And they're also behind log breastworks, oak and cypress breastworks, and they're hiding behind these things and they're impenetrable. The soldiers can't even see their enemy. Uh, the soldiers, the Tennessee volunteer casualties begin to mount. Um, they, their attack stalls out. The artillery now comes up. And another first occurs here at Jupiter at the Battle of Loxahatchee River. For the first time, when the artillery comes up and starts firing into the hammock to clear the Seminoles out from ahead of them, they start using rockets. They use the Congreve mm -hmm. rocket, which is primarily for signaling. But at this battle, they decided to start shooting them at the Seminoles. Well, you know, uh, we hear that the rockets worked well as far as, as far as their flight. But one of the officers, Captain Washington of the rocket battery, complains. He says, the rockets were working very well. The only problem was, is every time we tried to shoot the Seminoles, they would move. So he was quite frustrated at the fact that they would not stand still long enough for him to shoot them. Wow. Uh, so the, uh, the rockets probably did not do anything mm -hmm. other than basically confuse the entire battle and make it a lot, a lot of noise. With that, the, the, the Dragoons finally uh, gain the Sem into the Seminole village. They swim the, connect they swim the river. They get through the Cypress Swamp. They gain the Seminole village. And with that, they talk about the deafening silence. It was almost like somebody turned off a radio if radios mm -hmm. had been invented at that time. That the silence, all of a sudden the shooting stopped and it was as if ghosts had simply melted into the environment. Mm -hmm. There was not mm -hmm. a sign of any Seminole whatsoever. So at the end of the battle, there were 11 soldiers killed. There were 30 soldiers wounded. Uh, after the battle, there was one Seminole body found on the, on the battlefield, killed from uh, uh, the fire from the military. And there was out of probably the six or seven, 800 people that might have been at that, that village that day, not one Seminole was captured thus ending Jessup's uh, theory that this would be the last battle of the Seminole Indian War. Wow. And with that, the battle was, uh, was discontinued. The firing went on for a couple more hours. Nervous troops, two days later, they arrived at Pennock Point, constructed Fort Jupiter, and then the rest is the history that wow. we've already talked about at Fort Jupiter. Yeah, unbelievable. Right here, Jupiter, nine days apart, two significant battles. Right. Wow. Thank you so much, Glenn, for sharing all this history, local history, with us, the community, and everywhere else, what really happened here thank you. during the Seminole Wars. Thank you for thank all you. your pleasure. knowledge Hopefully and I got sharing it, right. it. Oh, yeah, you did. It was good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, we come back again so we could do another segment. Yeah. Are you in? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I yeah, I yeah. don't know what else we can talk about. I've oh, there's plenty. <laughs>